You're listening to the Real Estate Radio Hour, the show that brings you unfiltered stories and insight from the Twin Cities real estate world with your hosts, Chris Rooney, broker at REMAX Preferred, and Andy Presky, leader of the Preferred Home Team at REMAX Advantage Plus. What up? up? <laughs> Hola all. Hola all. Hola all. And he's just back from a beach party. Can you tell he was at the beach? Tan, red. He got red. That's stress. Oh, this market stressed me out, boys. How about this color? That that shows wisdom. Yeah, yeah. Come yeah. On, think, <laughs> think of it, Andy. You don't have many wrinkles. It's hard to tell. That's pretty good. You you age good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I got to turn the light down so you can't see anything. Oh, okay, it's all about the lighting. I agree. Yeah. Hey, I got, yeah, I got, yeah. the, I got some interesting things coming up here. I'm gonna go do a little showing of an apartment near the beach here. It's a duplex. Uh, I think about 1,500 uh, square feet, uh, private pool, balconies. Uh, price about 250 grand. So it's a little, little more spending than I thought in this area. But I'm gonna need some information from you guys. You know, what should I all look for when uh, looking at uh, foreign properties? So we'll get into that later. What about you guys? You're getting ready for July 4th. Are you partying? I, I uh, yeah, yeah, we we try to sneak up to the lake. I know we kind of come and go. I, I know a lot of us have different schedules and and crazy. You know, I have both my kids uh, are are nurses, so they have those crazy nursing schedules where twelve hours, and then they'll do two days in a row, and they get three days off. And so I know with that, and then we'll be up there uh, for most of the week. I've got a couple meetings towards the end of next week that I couldn't get out of. That uh, I think including this show, but. You guys are kind is, of slave drivers on that. Does side. Hannah got a job? Yeah, Hannah's interning down at Children's oh, cool. Hospital. Yeah, she she uh, is so sweet. I go, what do you do all day? She goes, I get to hold little babies that need love, and I'm like, what a cool job for my kid, man. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Is Connor's in Rochester still? No, Con believe it or not, Connor's up at Abbott now too in the cardiac um, oh. unit. So if you see a squirrely, uh, high-strung guy running around that looks like me, that's my kid. Yeah. I'll tell yeah, you I mean, though, I, I would—you're in no better hands than with that guy. He—he's got the knowledge base. I mean, I know he's—he's he's going on to do other things other than the nursing. I maybe shouldn't say that, but um, I know that that he currently—he'll sit down and he knows how to read the charts. He knows how to understand all the reports that come back, and he loves it. So like very passionate about it and uh that's cool why did you take this weird job this job where no one works at the real estate i don't you know I, I was my brother and i matt i don't know if you guys have ever really met matt but those of us that know my family my brother matt is more of the the studious you know uh higher education good time kind of guy where you'd think he'd have the job where it'd be like mine you know where you'd have the, uh, you know, uh, the real estate job or whatever. And instead, when I was younger, I actually through high school and college landscape, you know, um, I loved it. The physical labor, digging and, and smacking sledgehammers. I just, I loved all of it. Right. So I for sure thought that was going to be my destiny is going into some kind of a contractor trade or, you know, that's why I'm not afraid to take on a project. I mean, I'm not afraid to build a deck, you know, put in a fence, whatever. Cause 
when I was younger, that's what I did. So everybody thought Matt and I were going to have flip-flop jobs. Matt runs a big landscaping firm called Midwest Landscapes and uh, fantastic. I, I always, I try not to give them too big of a head, but I've, I've toured their facilities out in Otsego. It's impressive. I mean, everything, there's trucks go here. This is the car wash bay. This is the truck wash bay. This is where all the plantings are. This is, I mean, it's, it's super organized and uh, it's, it's actually, you get excited about landscaping, which is weird, but Everybody thought we'd be flip flop, but we're we're not. I also think when I go in and see a business that's freaking totally like things are lined up and they take care of it, because then that that way you feel like, geez, my my project's going to look clean. Typically, you find people that are in chaos. Your house turns into chaos. Yeah. So, but yeah, hey, that, uh, you know, I've I've learned that too in a short short uh, career here of only twenty some years. Yeah. Got to keep my office clean, keep my mind clean, you know? Yeah. A quick thing for going into what's happening in the market. Uh, I want you to comment on this quick. I don't know what you heard about me. About 6% of us. That's fair. I think there'll be, I think there'll be more. I, I would, I'm surprised that doesn't have another zero in front of it. Yeah, what are we? We're almost at July. Yeah, I would think so too. I think uh, this next by fall, I think we're going to see quite a few drop. Well, out. you know, you, I'll tell you, I mean, I, I've been looking at the numbers. There's some of the biggest teams in the state of Minnesota. Their numbers are in half. I mean, it's, oh, wow. oh yeah, it's so the, the volume is so much lower. Sale prices are still for consumers, sale prices are still good, but there's just not enough inventory. It's like, like the factory's running at half speed right and it's like i think inventory is up a little bit year over year from last year but we're still at like less than half of what it was before the pandemic so like we were way up here on the actually i, I probably have a chart for you uh, oh, really? please stand by oh weird i have one chris um here we go everybody so talking about like when we're way over here this is pre-pandemic so you've got you know across the bottom here these are all the years from you know 17 18 19 20 as we went across look at the inventory over here like the amount of inventory and then also we're going across pandemic hits of course we go down then we go up and we're still hovering down here so low and i think what's keeping it low is is interest rates right so people are just like they're they're very comfortable with their historically low locked interest rate that they've got and and they're in an affordable house that they paid for that they have a lot of equity in the payments are low and it's just not giving anybody the motivation to say, let's go and jump on there. Now, on the other hand, I think there's a little game being played by builders too, where builders have the ability now, there's plenty of inventory, plenty of labor. They could be ramping up the inventory, but they're not. So they're keeping high prices on their, their what they do have for sale because there's not a lot of it, right? Scarcity creates uh, demand and, and that demand is just, or pricing, you know? I was just in a, a neighborhood, uh, of a uh, of national builder. And what they were doing is they're not building the custom homes for people where they were taking orders all the time. They're building their specs and they're selling those. That's what's available. And then they'll bring the other ones available, which is really, I think, quite interesting, but that's a way in which to control, you know, maybe the fact that they're thinking, geez, things could get bad. Let's control what we've got and get rid of what we have. And well, and, and that might not them. be my choice, Chris. That that might be because the banks who finance a lot of their projects are saying we're good. We're, 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 our our uh, our threshold for pain right now is pretty low. So let's uh, let's you know get you back on the balance side of the balance sheet. And uh, you know we were talking about what's happening in the market, and yeah. I I don't know if I you recall, but last week or maybe it was the week before. I was mentioning that if your house doesn't sell in the first week, it's it's not all lost. So just went and out last night and showed a house, and it, it had been on like nine days, and we're kind of like, wow, there's there's no offers on it. It was just kind of surprising, and there's some reasons that um, I felt that they were not um, selling right away, and it was one of those houses that you have to think about. There's some things that weren't the greatest other things that were super great. And so you have to just kind of get over it. Well, after those nine days, now all of a sudden there's multiple offers. They're, they're doing, uh, you know, highest and best coming up here uh, before the weekend. But it's just like, it's, it's crazy that, you know, 
people think that, oh my gosh, if my house doesn't sell in two days, uh, I, you know, I'm done. And right. here's a great example of just being a little patient. Let people kind of think about it because they're, I mean, people are trained right now to be able to react and like, oh my gosh, it's going to sell right away. Oh, I don't want to get into multiples on this house. And then they start thinking about it and they're like, gosh, you know what? That house has a lot of things that I really want. And now I'm getting excited about it. Now all of a sudden, two or three people get excited about it again and it goes up again. So, well, Chris, you're, it's in interesting there. to say that because nationally, average days on market went from 30 days last year on average to 43. So we're up 13 days more. But, but here's what I wanted to show everybody again me and my charts, right? Mm -hmm. Take a look at this here. So, this is our pricing chart, right? So, we all kind of remember back here to, to June of last year. This was kind of the peak where we went up and we, we kind of peaked out. But here was May at 437. And now you come over to this side of the table and we're at 441. So in theory, we're still up from May over May of last year. And this is that dip everybody was talking about. And I think the big thing was, Chris, is that a lot of real estate experts went out there and stuck themselves on a limb and said, hey, prices are going down. And it put a lot of pause in the market. A lot of people are like, I knew it was coming. Here it comes. And so a lot of people paused on selling their houses, buying their houses. And it actually helped amplify the problem because now you have pent up energy. We still have a good jobs market. And so what's happening is these people that have good jobs that still want houses, they're like, they're used to the rates. So now, you know, even though they're hovering in the high sixes, low sevens, they're like, yeah, that is what it is. And they're putting uh, offers in on properties. So if jobs go down, we might see a real interesting market, right? Where all of a sudden you start seeing the prices soften or whatever. But for right now, the way we're sitting, I mean, everything is looking great. Hey, I got some game changing news for Minnesota. I think it's going to help out more of uh, the rural properties kind of outside the, the cities. So especially with the remote work, I want to hear you guys' thoughts on uh, this game, infrastructure. Game changing. Funding. Wow. Game changer, six hundred fifty wow. million. A game broadband. changer. Oh, broadband. That's uh, we can't hear anything. No, I'm not playing the the video. Oh, okay. Basically, <laughs> I was trying to be polite too. We're getting all the internet speeds faster across the states, and uh, how is this going to affect kind of outside uh, the Twin Cities area and, and housing overall? We've already seen it, um, Chris. I think you know. Uh, last year, I haven't not not this year as much, but last year I had five families that moved from Minneapolis up to northern Minnesota, where they were up in you know uh, within 20 miles of like Brainerd, um, Walker, um, and they have high speed internet, so they're they're working remotely, high speed from their rural properties with five acres, and they can live that uh, lifestyle that maybe they grew up in. Um, I think a lot of them grew up from smaller towns, moved to the city we're burnt out in the city life and are like, Hey, get me back out where I want to be. You know? Yeah. I think the so. question is more, our company is going to allow remote working. And if that's the case, I mean, why wouldn't people go there? I, I mean, if you're, if you're going an hour away and outside the twin cities, I mean, you're going to get a house for probably half the price. Not quite, but. Well, a, let me, let me, I was, I, this, so thank you for saying that because to me now, if you're working remotely, What's the difference if you're working remotely or you work overseas? And if there's somebody overseas that'll work for five bucks a day versus you're $1,000 or $500 a day or whatever your numbers are, right? At what point then do you outsource yourself overseas because you're just a computer screen filling in numbers or whatever? And I, I warn people about that all the time. I said, you're going to see this big shift in America because a lot of these people that are working remotely, you're the easiest ones to cut. I mean, yeah. you're the easiest ones to hire, the quickest ones to fire. I mean, you start hearing jobs now where people have two laptops going at one time. And they're working for two companies at the same time, putting in eight hours a day, earning 16 hours of pay. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that um, is brewing. And we're allowing it because I don't think these companies know how to correct and or, you know, but I, I wouldn't be shocked at all if eventually you go old school again and say, hey, yep, you got to be in the office here five days a week. Yeah, Andy, that's not fair to millennials. I mean, I, we got to probably hurt all of the house at too. one time, but Nick's going to want a house now too, and sit on his little Airbnb wherever he's at. With, with I'm assuming, with, with the tropical best country, possible, of course. The the big difference though is the time zone, the be able to speak English and uh, relationships, 100. percent I think definitely 
the government or someone's got to step in and say, hey, you can't just ship out all the jobs overseas or maybe give tax benefits to employers. But Nick, how do they know that they're not already overseas? Look at you. You could be working a job here in Minneapolis out of Brazil. What's the difference? No, no. no. I'm saying like they need to start figuring that out before the companies just say, okay, screw the Americans. We don't need to pay them. Let's go pay the dude uh, in Brazil and India yeah. and, and whatnot. So I don't know. I think I think tax benefits would be very ideal, especially for businesses in USA to still hire Americans, even if they're abroad. And then I know people who do like, hey, OK, you're going to live in this area. So obviously we're not going to pay you what we pay you in Minnesota. You know, we're going to pay you this percentage of, you know, what they kind of make down there or, or a little higher. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting for sure. But I know everyone got to taste the remote working and not many want to go back to the office. So I think it's going to be a, a quite a battle. Why would you? I think there, I think we've created our own beast. Because, you know, like you don't you don't have to get dressed when you work from home unless you're on a Zoom call or something. But then you only have to, you know, do the upper half that's on camera. You know, I mean, it's like so it's there's a lot of benefits to it. There's a lot of, you know, you don't have to drive and get stuck in traffic. Yeah. Commute, you know, commuting is huge. But like I'm saying to you, if you don't talk to anybody all day long and all you do is grind out numbers and work on spreadsheets, I'm warning you that that job can be as long as somebody's capable of doing the same task. I mean, they're going to go to the lowest bidder. Well, AI too, especially if you're not, I mean, that's going to take over a ton of it, but Andy, I got uh, your main man, your, your, partner, your partner in crime right here. Um, yeah. some people, uh, they're talking about, is he delusional or not? Let me Ooh. post it up here. Reddit. Well, that's good. You're going to put me on the spot. Uh, that's great. Right. Okay. Ramsey said buyers should pay more than a quarter of the take home pay on a 15 year mortgage. Now, keep in mind, a 15-year mortgage uh, is a higher payment. This dude is so out of touch with reality. I'm surprised he has such a large base of followers. Who said this? There's a huge Reddit thread. Like Everyone was agreeing, too, that Ramsey is stuck in the past and that this does not apply to, to modern day, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to hear what you guys think, especially when well, Biden... I think what he's doing is in, instead of saying it's okay to be in third place, he's setting the bar up at first place. And so, you know, if you want to be a winner, here's what you should do. You want to train for a marathon? Here's what you should do. If you want to have financial success, here's what is a great path to follow to put yourself in a situation where you can succeed. And I think that's what they're saying is that if you have 15% of your gross uh, income dedicated to a mortgage payment, um, and, and that's actually, I hate to say it, but it's probably pretty easy to do nowadays because with reality of people buying and selling houses and they have tons of equity that they didn't have before, they're buying down the next property that they buy most of the Ramsey followers, if you think about this, the goal is to be debt free and not be a, literally a slave to the debt. That's the goal. And so he's if you actually look at what his message is, his message isn't like saying you're out of reality. You're not you're not a good person. He's saying that, hey, you know, you don't have to worry about a job that you hate if, if you don't have debt. You don't have to worry about a job that you hate or doing something you don't want to do if it doesn't align with your morals. You know, for example, like school, a lot of these these uh, people that are in their programs, with they don't believe what the, the, some of these schools are teaching their children. So they make a plan to have one of the, the two spouses stay home and support the, you know, the in-home education. Um, there's, there's a big push on a lot of that stuff now where they don't want the morals or the, the beliefs of other people trickling into the education system on top of just being financially free. I think that's the key. If you, if you look at like the, the, the parts that I enjoy about the Ramsey following that I enjoy um, are when people come in and do their debt-free scream. So you're talking about people that literally couldn't do anything. They could hardly buy their groceries on Fridays and then they get into their programs and they learn how to get out of that debt. And, and, you know, they, they still have good debt, but they don't have bad debt. Right. So they get rid of the credit cards and the high interest paying stuff that you never catch up on. And then you get back into the point of where you're debt free. And some of these stories will make you cry. I mean, you, you hear about these people that are six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars in debt. And then he helps them make their own decisions and say, here's a goal for you. So that's for an example, that might be one of the goals. And then you work towards getting there. You don't, you don't, they have what they call baby steps in this program. So you take baby steps towards getting there. But the idea there is that you're taking steps towards making yourself free. And, 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 and uh, being in control of your finances. And it actually, anybody that doubts it, I, I recommend you look at it. So delusional is not an accurate statement at all. Uh, 
Okay, I had to unmute myself. Awkward pause. Thank you. Unmute um, myself. Yeah, but on, on the whole Ramsey situation, is I think it's pretty simple to say, hey, you should only pay make a quarter of your take home pay to do a fifteen year mortgage. I mean, that's pretty. I mean, that's if that was the case, this economy would be destroyed right now. But is it a goal? It's a great goal. I mean, if you're able to do that and well, whatever, but a lot of people the context, made money on real estate as well. Like I'm saying, Chris, that's that's just he's not the the statement's not being put into context of how it's being said. Of course, that's what I'm saying. It's completely throwing this conversation the wrong way. It's like telling your kids they should save fifteen percent of their income. Oh, what a absolute nut! How do you save fifteen percent of your income? Well, right. come on. It's like when you go down to if you can focus and have discipline, you have a job. And you set yourself up to where you don't overspend, show some discipline in how you take on debt and pay it off responsibly. That's all this program's about. That it really is in a nutshell. And I can't speak on their behalf. I'm not allowed to, nor would I. But I tell you what, they've helped more people than they've hurt. Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, millions of people have been helped. Yeah. Ask anybody that's debt free from those guys that, you know, do their coaching and stuff like that. And I, I, I'm only passionately fighting this because I think the problem with, our, our whole system we have, schools teach people how to be employees. These employees go out there and get jobs and they punch the clock. And then they let envy like on Facebook and Instagram really pile up. And then all these people, oh, I need a new boat too, because they have a new boat and I deserve a new boat. And also they go and buy a new boat they can't afford. And then they buy a bigger house that they can't afford. And all of a sudden you have all this debt. And then what happens to you? You have to punch that clock pretty darn hard every Monday morning, or you're never going to get out of that mess. Right. And, and we've also been taught that we have the pride of never having bad credit. So it's like we got to just, you know, be these these payment makers. Well, guess who gets rich off that? You want to talk about conspiracies? That's where the conspiracy is, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, is it more referring to like the inflation and how expensive homes are now that it's, it's very hard to put one fourth of your your income towards it? And like Chris was saying, too, like if everyone did that, the whole economy would be destroyed because real estate is about leverage, isn't it? Yeah, but you know, if you if you actually put, like I said, put his phrase into context, he'll tell you that it's okay to get a 30-year mortgage if that's all that you can afford, right? But put as much money down as you can to avoid mortgage insurance. Then the next step is get into a 15-year mortgage. And then all ideal situation so that you're ready for any kind of a storm that comes at you is to position yourself to where you only have 15% of your gross income going towards, like for an example, a payment. It doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. Don't buy a house unless you can do this. He says good debt is, is you know, he's telling everybody to buy houses right now because he thinks houses are going to keep going up with the way that we're spending money as a country. He thinks, you know, and, I, and I, if you watch his stuff, he, he goes, these houses are on sale. They're going to keep going up. They're not, we're not going to, the, the world's not stopping. The world's not going backwards right now. So all the indicators are showing, you know, as, but anyway, my point is, is that they basically help you with a guide. And, and I think that the, the guide is for a lot of people that aren't educated on, on what debt is or that it's, it's evil. It, it, you shouldn't be excited to have a credit card. You should be scared of it. I mean, you know, I, I look at a lot of my business buddies and they say the best way to control your spending is to pay cash, right? So they go through and they pay cash for everything because they can control what they spend. A lot of people just whip out the credit card until they say it's, it's full. All right, let's get into a little... Sorry. Andy Prasky segment. We'll keep you rolling. We're going to do a this or that on two lakes. So let me bring up your commercial though. You know a lot about the, this area. Uh, Andy Prasky, preferred home team. Well, they said I could have 30 seconds on the show for a quick ad. Andy Prasky, Remax Advantage Plus. Andy at Prasky.com if you want to email us. Here's the thing. 22 years in the business, over 1,400 sales. I'd like to help you with your real estate needs. If that's buying, if that's selling, if that's building, Whatever it is, give us a call, send us an email. Let's get you started on your real estate journey. I'd like to help you on the way. Uh, lots of experience here, and I uh, would like to put it to work for you. Andy Prasky, Remax Advantage Plus. Thanks for listening to the show. Whoa. You are amazing, Andy. Your car just flies. I don't. Uh, I don't understand uh, what I'm doing in that commercial. You don't. <laughs> You're telling people to use you. You're Andy Prasky. Oh yeah. boy, what do we got here for a lake, Andy? Chisago Lakes or Ham Lake? Uh, Chisago. Isn't Chisago a lot? Is that? Isn't that a lot bigger lake than just Chisago? 
Um, yeah, it it actually, if you look at Chisago Lake is like basically Lindstrom area. You know, if you really yeah. look at it, they also have the Chisago Lakes area. Um, a lot of people will buy up there in that area. And there is a Chisago Lake, but there's a ton of other lakes up in that area that are very popular. So um, when you look at like, for example, Chisago Lake, and it it's a chain of, I think, three, four lakes here together. Um, you know, and it's nice. It's a little, you know, not as quite as uh, deep, um, you know, in some areas. So the water's a little uh, cloudier, but it's not as, you know, I don't know. It's, 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 they're nice. It's very nice. It's close it's to the really, great commute. And it's really not that far out either. No, no. I build houses up there, sell houses in Chisago yeah. Lake all the time. So it's uh, kind of, if you think about it being a little north of like Forest Lake there. So what would you say from a, a, a lake cabin or decent house price points where they are up there? Well, you know, boy, I tell you, just like everything else around here, I mean, you're seeing houses that are creeping up into the millions up there, but it's like, you know, you also have, uh, you could still buy that, you know, $350,000 cabin that somebody had way back in the day that now you could, you know, enjoy in the summer and then, you know, probably fix it up and, and uh, or, or possibly replace it with a new house and retire. You're still close to everything though. Chisago is like right off of 35. So it's like, it's right there. Lots of all the modern amenities and Forest Lake are all right there. Um, great, great pocket. I mean, and it actually kind of, I don't know, Chris, if you've been up to Lindstrom, has a real vacation vibe to it. It's like you pull into town and it's very, uh, uh, what is it? It's, uh, the Norwegian kind of Swedish kind of vibe to it. And and uh, the bakeries and the and it, you feel like you're on vacation kind of when you pull into town. You know, you're muted, Chris. I built this. My mouse is being kind of fidgety. Yeah. But um, I showed a house up there in Lindstrom, and uh, it was a it was an acreage parcel that uh, the Amish had built one of the pole buildings there, and it was like eighty by one forty. It was the freaking coolest thing ever. I mean, the way they build stuff, I mean, it's like that thing will never come down. Oh, but yeah. I was just, a, I was surprised that it was as close as it was uh, to the Twin Cities. I don't really work that area that much. Um, my brother-in-law. Yeah, you know, if you Bruce, take the exit that goes to Taylor's Falls, I think that's the easiest way to describe it. You take eight, I think it is. Um, take the Taylor's Falls exit, like you're going out to Wild Mountain or whatever, or Turtle Lake or wherever you're headed, yeah. and you drive right through Lindstrom, and that's kind of that general area. Yeah. Um uh, my uh, brother-in-law is a realtor, Bruce Sedova, and he uh, that's where he's from. So anytime we have stuff up there, he takes over for, yeah. for us. Just because you gotta you gotta know that area, the knowledge of the the area to to know what you're getting. Because for what this the price of this was, I mean, in Credit River, someone would have paid 1.8 million, and it was a million up there. Yeah, and it was that big of a difference. But they have more of them up there than what we have here. So. Right. Right. Yeah, no, and it is, it's a, uh, it's a very, I actually think it's a kind of a sleeper community right now. It's like even that forest lake area, you know, you have those um, you know, the three lakes and forest lake there too. And you have houses that are up to $6 million on that chain. And, you know, and to get on that chain is very hard under 500,000, even for a teardown. And you get up to Chisago, you can still save and, you know, be in the threes, um, so it's a little more affordable, wow. but you know, when you build, I'm telling you, that's, that's the zinger right now is like the fantasy of buying a lot and building a house is where a lot of people, including myself, there's a little bit of delusion there. Like, the, Oh, I'll just build a $300,000 house. Well, you sit down with most builders, they don't have anything under half a million. So now you're committed to building an 800 to a million dollar investment, which is, which is fine. If you've got the budget, God bless you. Let's do it. Um, but a lot of people are trying to get the whole thing done for a half a million. And it just, the, the money's not there. Then you got to look for existing. So that's where I see a lot of value. So if you were looking at existing homes, Ham Lake, or excuse me, uh, Chisago Lakes is, is the place. So Yeah. And I think sometimes when people are looking for something affordable from an affordable cabin, I think you also have to kind of take into consideration how long it takes to be able to get there. And that might be a yeah. good spot, that Chisago Lake uh, area, to kind of be able to get that geez, maybe I'm going to pay a couple hundred thousand more, but I'm going to use it a lot more. 
It's that right. Wednesday when I want to, uh, I've got three hours to kind of kill. I can go up and mow the lawn real fast. Yep. But uh, what about Ham Lake? So Ham Lake is actually a very small lake. When you look at Ham, like I think of Ham Lake as being kind of like your credit river down south where you have beautiful acreage and really nice houses. It's kind of like the east um, Andover. Um, you know, if you're looking for a few acres to build a beautiful house, Ham Lake is, is the spot to look for. Um, beautiful homes up there being built. So the lake itself is actually a very small little circle. Um, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine developed some lots on the, the north end of that lake. And uh, I mean, they had lake lots for, for 300,000. So it was, uh, and, and Ham Lake literally, Chris, is shaped like a ham. That's why they call it Ham Lake. It's, <laughs> it's really? a little round, little ham with a little island in the middle. It looks like the, looks like the bone. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of wow. cute. But it's, it's not much of a, uh, when you think of like a lake, lake, that when you say ham lake, I don't think of water. I think of like acreage, um, you know, up there. But the lake is a small little, get a pontoon, takes you 20 minutes to go around it probably. Okay. It's a small lake, yeah. Very small, yeah. Yeah. What do you, uh, what would you pick? Oh, Chisago Lakes, hands down. For for lake, like living. I mean, Chisago is going to give you that, multiple lakes to pick from, fishing, skiing, you know, all that fun stuff that, you know, I see, but I'm a recreational lake guy. So right. I, I like the, the toys and the fun and Hey, let's, you know, go to town on, by boat and go to the restaurant or whatever. I love that. So Chisago Lake would probably be my choice for water. Um, as far as for return on investment and building a beautiful house on acreage, Ham Lake's a shining star there too. I mean, Chisago has a lot of areas up there too, you know, that kind of around there that are, are you know, uh, Lint Township and some of those areas that are, are really nice that have, you know, more acreage available, but um, I'd go Ham Lake for the big fancy house with the big garage. And I'd go Chisago Lakes for living on the lake, fishing and enjoying recreational. Very, very good, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now the second half of the show will be all Chris. Yeah. Uh -huh. I feel like I've done all the talking. That's all right. Well, I know yeah. the guy who's got this one listed. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, we're going to go over this iconic property. It's going to be brought to you by Mr. Chris Rooney, Home Experts. We even got a video to watch. So wow. I was just one years old when my family started in real estate, where both my parents were agents. They also dabbled in investing in real estate, rentals, flips, and construction. After college, I went right into getting my license in July of 1990. As a 23-year-old agent in an industry that looks nothing like today, I had to know more for my clients to choose me. There wasn't Zillow or social media to tell them how good I was. I had to win them over with knowledge. With knowledge comes confidence, and with confidence comes results. I found well, it is one of the most expensive homes to ever go up for sale in the entire state of Minnesota. Right on the shores of Wyzetta Bay, it is now looking for its next owner. And Adam Duxter is getting an exclusive tour and peek inside of a home that you will only see on WCCO. Whether you're playing in it or playing on it, the draw to Wyzetta Bay is the water. If you want to get a home here, you got to make a splash. When I bring friends into Wyzetta or out on the lake, they're like, wow, who lives there? What do they do? But for a house like this to hit the market. The word wow happens quite often when I show the home. Well, that is making waves. Everybody's curious, which is not a, not a surprise, not a shock. Everybody wants to come in and take a look and see a, you know, an almost $15 million house, which is understandable. Jim Schwartz helped make this waterfront home a reality when his clients built it in 2016. Obviously, you start with the view, but five bedrooms, seven bathrooms in seven years later, those same clients are looking to sell price tag 14.75 million. It's gotten to a point where kids are getting older and kids are gone. And so now they're just looking to downsize and move on. And so as you walk in, you've got his and her closets. Thursday, Schwartz opened the door showing everything from the custom living space. It's a fun, fun level to the theater and golf simulator. Right. So that'll close. Even the elevator. He says he's on a global search for the right executive or entrepreneur who could be the buyer. If they're interested, my information is everywhere. So the only contingency. I hope whoever buys it really enjoys it. 
and if they ever throw a party, I'd love to go. <laughs> Adam Doctor, WCCO News. <laughs> that, did you see that first clip um, they showed of the house where they showed the chipping paint on the chimneys? Oh, really? Uh-huh. Uh, I, I would have had that immediately cut. <laughs> Doctored up. They were showing the two chimneys, and they showed the boat going by in between them. And uh, there's oh. there's chipping paint up there. Got a total realtor right Wasn't there. Isn't that the guys that own Crave that own that? What that he I think that was no, no, this is this is in Wyzetta Bay. I don't know who owns it. Yeah, but gosh, I, I, I thought it was the guys that own Crave. Um no I, I don't think so. That's the okay. one over by Excelsior, I believe. But um it uh it's that real. Still a lot of sushi rolls though for that place. Yeah, it's a fun. It's it's a fun spot. I mean, it's a, a peninsula, and then kind of between like Gray's Bay coming into Wyzetta Bay. Uh, it's it's what you see. I tell you, I wanted to. I was hoping they'd do a, a shot of how those garages work because uh, they kind of come in underneath. I was just kind of curious about that. But I, be I believe I've said heard the same thing where the you go down and it has a turnaround and like a sixteen car underground parking garage. Is that, and okay, yeah, because I think that would be super cool and how it's kind of set up there but jim jim schwartz he's a good guy i've done some deals with him and cool. he's uh he's a good guy he's a good marketer does do very yeah. well sure yeah well he got wcco's attention yeah yeah and those but those are the kind that you you go out and hunt for that and try to get someone to do a story on it and they're they're not going to not do it but what a great way in which to be able to market and because a lot of people that buy those types of homes want something that uh everyone else wants you know like that that gal said at uh downtown wyzetta there you know everyone asked well who lives there and who who would have that and oh my gosh i want to go to one of their parties and yeah uh, but that lake minnetonka is full of that it's uh it's a very oh. interesting that's not even close to the biggest house either not even close no i know our old buddy uh marty davis built quite a shack out there a couple of years ago yeah and his two brothers there's three of them that are unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. Well, they they uh, did some nice, uh, did did some smart business moves. Yeah, yeah, they're they're fine. So they're they're not struggling to make the uh, the tax payments. Probably within fifteen percent of their fifteen percent mortgage, fifteen year. There's probably no mortgage. There's properties that have three hundred thousand dollar property tax bills out there. Yeah. So Isn't that crazy. Imagine that. Yeah. Just. Just the property taxes. Well, it's all relative. I mean, you know, just like yeah. they always talk about that. You know, it's uh, it is. it's crazy to me. It, and it there are people that you think you're successful, and then there's a whole different level of success that's up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's big money, big money. Yeah. Well, good luck to those guys. I hope they they have some success and find a new buyer and and make a family really happy. Yeah. There you go. How do, how do you go about getting that WCCO spot? You just go reach out to them. You write an article. Yeah, you. I've done those things before too. I in my old days, I used to work hard at that, getting these PR releases. That's how I got on the news a couple of times. You write an article about something that's interesting. If they decide to pick it up, and they'll make you the lead on the story, and then uh, you give them all. You make their job easy. You kind of in the in the you know say here's where we can shoot it. Here's what the you know we can cover. Here's how long the thing could be. And some of those news companies are craving stuff like that. Yeah, and. There's some area that you won't let them film. I mean, you kind of, you set it up strategically at the beginning because it's kind of like, I mean, in that every, like a person wants to have that home because they want everyone to know that they have it. They also don't want everyone to have been in their home. It's because that, right. so now all of a sudden if that film crew comes in and they completely go through the whole thing, it's not as exciting. So you got to be careful with that. Yeah. Well, I think you're, you're onto something there. And I think that, you know, the thing about uh, the media, they're looking for clicks, they're looking for views. So if that's something that you'd be like, you're, you're making dinner and you're like, Oh, I was going to shut the TV off. You're like, Oh, I want to see that house. That, that Those are the kind of stories that those companies will, or the, the news media will pick up. Yeah. Nope. Yep. Fun. Yeah. Gosh. Breaking news. White is out and wood is back in. We are seeing this become one of the biggest trends in 2023. People want natural wood looks in their kitchens and bathrooms. And we're really seeing this make a huge resurgence right now, adding value to people's homes. Not totally. 
I think a combination is what people want. Well, you know, you know what a lot of it was, Chris, and I'm just, you know, not that I was picking on the national builders, but these Wall Street builders come into town and they want to offer a really nice looking house at a better price. And a lot of that's MDF, you know, so these guys were making, you know, a lot of these cabinets that are not necessarily real wood. They're, they're made out of wood, but they're not like an actual wood door. Um, like you see when you have uh, like a natural uh, stained cabinet and, you know, they go to white and a lot of times like the high end, like you're talking about, they're enameling or urethaning that white. So it's beautiful finish, like, you know, hard as nails. So it doesn't chip. Um, a lot, and, and, and that's where I think a lot of people got confused for a while. So the white trend really came in and pushed out a lot of the local cabinet guys. I mean, when we used to sit down, you remember this, Chris, two, early 2000s, you'd sit down and we'd say, okay, well, what kind of species of wood do you want for your trim? What species of wood on top of the color, you know, and, and nowadays it's, it's just like, is it wood or is it white? Yeah. And, and here's your five colors. So. Yeah. But I do think there's a lot of wood that is coming back, but I think it's just more of a, it's more of a mix rather than all wood or all enamel. So, yeah. And it looks good. It really does. And with metal, metal and black as well. Yeah. You, know, all, you add all those things together. It's just kind of, uh, I mean, and it, and it goes together. So. Yeah. Yes. Hey, life changes. You got to keep up with it. I think that's a that's a good thing. I think if it was the same and everything was kind of boring and it just I don't know. I think that waking up and just waiting to die is no fun. That's my opinion. Change it up. Let's put some curveballs in it and you get to deal with some adversity. I like that. That's all right. Oh. Holy cow. Maybe there's gang activity here. That's crazy. <laughs> Set that up, Andy. There's your video walkthrough. <laughs> that's I think that's kind of funny myself. It is, it, but it does tell you how quick an outside, you can have the perfect house on the perfect lot. And if you're not in a good area, down the tubes, maybe. I, don't, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people don't know what to do, but when you have a neighborhood, you need to stick up and defend your neighborhood for sure. Because all of a sudden it becomes, you know, that, you know, label and people don't, you don't have a choice. People do it for you and they'll say it's not safe or it's, you know, there's whatever going. And then all of a sudden properties are hard to sell values, you know, soften. And all of a sudden you have a place that nobody wants to live. So people want you to stick up for yourselves. People want you to, you know, fight to keep your neighborhood nice. Um, you know, I don't know if you've heard that old saying location, location, location. It's very important where it does. And it's the same thing with a, you know, an urban place or a yeah. rural place, you know, you For gotta, sure. where, depends where you put it. I mean, you're going to be, could be a million dollars difference because of it. So. Right. Right. <laughs> oh boy. I just bought a house with my girlfriend closed last month. We share ownership. Although I make at least two thirds of the household income. We're now separated. And we'll not be getting back together. Both still living in the home. What do we do with the house? We bought it for three hundred ninety thousand and put five percent down. How much do we need to sell it for, and not be losing money with all the associated fees, etc.? Or are there other creative ideas? Not in search of relationship advice. LOL. Well, I think that is something to to learn from this story. Um, if you're going to go into ownership with someone, that uh, the courts won't make the decision what you do with it. You should have some sort of an agreement together prior to that and state exactly what you're going to do if it doesn't work out and who's going to take it and who's going to pay it off. And any business arrangement of yeah. any kind, yeah. have an exit strategy on the front end that you both agree to, then it's simple and it's easy. You follow the rules, you can be amicable, um, you know, and, yeah. and for an example, like you both still live there. Well, cause it's not easy to find a place to live while you're still paying your mortgage. Um, yeah. The thing is, is this, is that first of all, you know, how much do we have to sell for to get out of it? Well, that's not the right approach to it. I, I would say, what's it worth? 
So first of all, you're gonna have to look at, you know, is it worth more? I'm assuming it is. Um, we would, you know, figure what the actual market value is for that home to get you the best terms, the best conditions, the best price. Now, on the other hand, what if it's not worth what it was when you bought it? What if it, you're in an area where all of a sudden the houses are slowly declining, which I'd find hard to, to find in today's market. But if it was, then you have to come up with alternatives. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to split the debt? Or when you sell the property, are you going to try to sell it yourselves? Are you, what are you going to do to get out of that mess? Um, but the first thing I would do is, I'd, I don't know if you agree with this, Chris, maybe start with having uh, an agent or two come out there give you an uh, estimated evaluation of the property values. So you have at least one or two to compare from. If you're broken up, but you're amicable um, with each other, that that is a big step forward. But if you're not, then just say, hey, why don't we both have a real estate agent come out for, for both of us? So we can, and then let's compare notes on, on who has the best. And then, you know, maybe even bring in a third person that's independent, you know, that uh, they can help you guys establish a value Decide, do you have the skill set to sell it yourselves to save the money? Um, because maybe you have to, or can you afford to sell it with an agent? Or do you both want an agent to sell it? Yeah. Because that might add to the stress. If you're both trying to break up and one of you is trying to sell it, and then one of you thinks that they did more of the selling than you did, and it can create another fight. So, you know, maybe it is a, uh, an agreement that you make that we both agree to hire a professional to sell it. Um, yeah. And that's a good start that I think Andy you hit on all of that stuff perfectly. If we had to go to that person and tell them though, Hey, what is it going to take? You're, you're probably at 425 to be, try to get out of there. Um, unscuffed we'll say, but um, I think there's other ways in which to do it. I mean, talk to each other's so one or the other want to do it, you know, and then just basically you could quick claim your interest over. There's a problem with the mortgage then. If you're both on the mortgage and your name's on it, it's going to hurt you for qualifying later. If one of the if the person who you uh, quit claimed your interest, which basically means, hey, it's yours, it's not mine, you know, it's it's all yours. But that mortgage goes bad, or they make uh, missed payments on that, it's going to affect your credit rating. So sometimes, even if it's worth four hundred and it's going to cost you fifteen thousand to get out of, it's worth it paying the fifteen thousand and chalk it up to I should have had an agreement before I got into this place. And the first thing. And then, well, and it's it's it is unromantic to say, hey, if we ever break up, what are we gonna do? But on the other hand, you know, blame your parents or blame you know your brother or sister. Your realtor. Say, hey, they told me that we should really have an exit strategy here. Your realtor, your realtor should be bringing that up. I bring it up every time. I said, yeah, yeah we know. Well, what, what, what if too, what if one of the two of them passes away? Yeah. Then what is what is the you know then what? You got does it. The other one just get it. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a good conversation to have. And for someone else to be able to bring it up, I had that one time where the client asked me to bring it up and I did, you know, so, but it was this, this was a case of the one person was doing all the buying, but this person was going to be in on it. And I said, you just want to make sure that they know exactly because it was her, she was actually going to give some money towards the down payment. So yeah, and I mean, you know, and there's lots of ways for them to protect their interests in that property. They can they can file a lien against that property for the amount that they deposited, for an example. Um, but that that gets dangerous too, because if in the future you break up and they want their money back and they start foreclosing on you to get their money back out, versus you know, I had one of my clients in the past made the mistake, honest mistake, of saying, "Well, you put a deposit on the house too. We're we're in a relationship. Um, you know, you put twenty thousand down." Let, let's put you on the deed. And then when they broke up, uh, he was on vacation and got locked out of the house and then never was allowed back into the house that he had in his name and actually originally and had the mortgage on the property. But because she was on the deed, um, she was allowed to lock him out of the house and, you know, and said she had equitable title and blah, blah, blah. And it was a fight. And, and you can't just kick people out. So it, yeah. it, you be very careful when you sign things. Yeah. We had that uh, same thing, actually, Chris and I did when we bought our first house together. I had owned a house uh, prior to that, um, got the money out of it, very little money. She had a lot of money. <laughs> we both qualified for it, but we never signed anything. Obviously, we ended up getting married. We're still married, but, um, you know, that, that it can cause a problem. So it's just best to get past the, oh, oh my gosh, you don't trust me. We're not going to get married. Are you cheating on me? What are you doing? No, don't forget that. Just 
have it set up that you know exactly what's going to happen. And because you don't. And it, like Andy said, the one thing that they don't think about, is what if one of them passes away prior to that happening? You know, what is going to happen? Because that's a, I mean, that's a horrible thing. If you're counting on someone else to be able to pay for half of it, and now you got to deal with all their heirs, you know? Well, you know, and so there's, there's something to be said for that. So I've had uh, in the past where we had business relationship kind of in, where they had to have a life insurance policy, each one of them to help offset if they passed away for the other partner. So mm -hmm. that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, uh, partner A is alive, partner B passes away, partner B's uh, insurance policy pays off the mortgage for partner A, and they can live there happily ever after. Now, a lot of people get upset about that, but it, the whole point of it is, is that that you, you can have an arrangement that doesn't have to be morbid. It can actually be very positive for both parties. You don't want to make it too positive, Chris, because then you might end up... Uh, well, but uh, you that's, know. that's what I was going to say. It's, it, maybe it's an insurance policy for 25000 or something. You know, yeah. so there's, there's yes, not a lot of died. incentive, a lot of incentive to kind of push her off the edge. Yeah. So, oh, my gosh. What happened? She drowned. Uh, really... We were in the Grand Canyon and she jumped. I don't know. It I, uh... it happened. Can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. She tripped. Yeah. Um, she totally. Totally. Tri I told her not to jog. That exercise no! thing is so overrated. No. Funny? Like, for for my help and then also for clients that are thinking about retiring out of the country uh what is a foreign property checklist uh to go over what kind of questions should be asked and uh, what information do you guys need but i'll tell you one thing nick i would 100 percent try to figure out what the process is first to me the process is you know do, do they mortgage things there what are, what are the expenses that we don't know from the united states so um, trying to be able to say, hey, give me a comparison. What happens in the U.S. versus here? So you can get some information from, you know, back home, because more than likely you're going to probably work with a realtor or a person that doesn't really speak the same language, that might not speak the same lingo, meaning what they might think of mortgages and what we think of mortgages are two different things. I had clients from Australia, and when we were talking, they were like talking about, I can't remember what it was, but... It was like something totally different how we would use that word than how they would use that word. And then we finally got kind of on the same page when I talked to the realtor they were using. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's what it's like, because he had dealt with that quite a few times. So I think that's number one. So you can kind of get on the page and you can start thinking of quest other questions. Um, I, I would I would look at how you going on the deed. Um, are you allowed to have a fee simple? deed where you actually own it it's protected it's insured so that just because you're from another country it can't be taken away from you um you know a lot of these uh countries now don't want a bunch of foreign owners which is funny because america as we have all these you know big corporations from other countries buying farmland and everything else around mm -hmm. us um america doesn't seem to care as much as other countries do other countries want to be owned by their own citizens and so they limit the amount of foreign owners that there are so that being the case, um, you know, uh, the, anyway, th that's kind of my little bit of, so talk to an attorney locally. Um, like, I, and maybe you're okay with a hundred year lease or something like that. Cause you're not going to see the end of the lease. Maybe your kids will, but you know, what's that worth to you and your family over the next couple of years? You know, is there any way for people to extract or take the deed away from you? Um, and all of a sudden they own it because you didn't pay your property taxes in two days. And, you know, I mean, there's some weird stuff out there, Nick. Andy, you said you you talked about this probably ten years ago, uh, on this exact same thing, and uh, I was really like, oh my gosh, yeah, I I never really thought of that, but now all of a sudden on the political circuit, I, Nikki Haley just came out and said that she wants uh, any land owned by China to be taken back, you know. So is can that happen in another country? You know, do you own it under do do you own it under your your own yourself, or do you you know, buy it under a corporation. I think there's a lot of little pieces that, I mean, someone that I, I would try to find someone that knows Brazil, if Brazil, if it's Brazil that you're going, Brazil and America together, because I think that's super important to know, you know, what you're getting into, because you could be throwing a bunch of money into something that they could maybe take away from you, you know, and there's, right. there's land leases. I mean, some, some we own the land, and we own the house. There's some places that you don't get that. And then at that point, how do you finance? Are the, right. the banks in Brazil willing to finance you? 
our people in America, or do you got to pay cash? No, it's it's it definitely it's not as easy as I just want to buy because the rules aren't the same in every country, and so for sure, I, I always say too, you know, Nick, take a little history lesson from somebody that's been around a while. You know, sit down with that older real estate agent, let them tell you the story about what's happened over the years, what they did, what's happened in the past, how did they hurt people, help people, you know, um, could you see like a lot of countries like like Belize now where they're, they're advertising to the U.S. saying, hey, bring your foreign dollars here. We have a, a much, you know, no tax. We have this. We have that. I mean, there's all these benefits that they're trying to allure you to bring your money in. And of course, that's the landowner that's selling their land that wants you to come in and pay an absorbent price for it. And, and that's OK. That's that's, you know, that's capitalism. But. Yeah, I think the biggest thing. Because like in Mexico, too, you can't own the land. It's a 100-year lease. In Thailand, you can't. Uh, it has to be in a condo, an apartment, or in someone else's name, a Thai citizen's name. But there's a lot of programs now in some countries where, okay, you get permanent residency, and then after uh, three, five years, you get the passport. And I think you, obviously, when you have the passport, you have the same rights as citizens here. So for sure, you got to look at uh, what country and, and what kind of shenanigans are going on. Because like you said, it's happened in Mexico, in Tulum. I, I heard that from when I was in Mexico, yeah. that a bunch of... French people bought land and built hotels and it was going so good. And then the cartels came in there and took it away. Like uh, the whole governments were going at each other because of it too. And I don't think the French uh, people got their, got their money back. Well, a lot of those big oil companies too, they had oil rigs and everything else got that. Off Venezuela, the they uh, nationalized everything. Yeah. So, yeah. well, you know, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's their prerogative as a country and, and they make decisions that will affect how money flows in and out of their country. And, and I understand that. I mean, it, it's, it's just a matter of like you as you're looking for an investment opportunity, you know, a place to, to live, a place to maybe have a family, whatever. I mean, it's like, and that, that is a, just doing your homework is a big part of it. Understanding that, you know, when you hire a local um, attorney, some of those attorneys aren't, you know, make sure that <laughs> some countries you can just call yourself an attorney. Like in India, I guess you can call yourself a doctor because you're really good at like helping people not be sick. Um, but you don't have to have the credentials. You don't have to have the education. So like, there's a lot of these, you make sure that when they say they're an attorney, that they actually are an attorney, whatever that means, um, or a specialist. Um, but anyway, I, I, I would start with, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be brand specific. Uh, where's my brand over here. Um, but I, I would, I would start with a Remax agent in those countries. that will tell you the entire story, tell you about who to talk to, who not to talk to. And, and that's uh, something that is one of the, the advantage, not to be a Remax commercial, but that's what I would do personally. And I would talk to a couple agents and see which one I felt most comfortable with, who told you the consistent story, um, you know, yeah. that's right start. Yep. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, let's do a little uh, rapid fire. Got some questions here. Uh, and uh, let me get uh, our little video. Odd question. Since there is a housing shortage, why are we not building large amounts of smaller homes, Chris? Because the land, uh, should the landowners sell it for cheaper, their land, so we can make smaller houses? That's the problem. There's just, and, and can the lumber companies reduce their lumber costs? Because, and can people do uh, lower labor? Because that's the only way you're going to get it. And it's not happening. Well, and I'll tell you this. The other thing is that I've got a couple of builders that build in Minnesota and they build in Wisconsin. They claim that with the, the difference in the fees and the building codes, they can build on, a, on about a 3,000 square foot two-story. They can build it 40,000 cheaper in Wisconsin than they can in, the, in, the, in uh, Minneapolis. Because of the freaking bureaucracy crap the fees the extra building codes the fire tapings the all the other you know and they may be for good reason that they are obviously they're enforcing it for safety a lot of it but the permitting fees i mean i don't think most people realize like the the water and sewer connections um when, when a developer comes in and pays transportation connection fees pays you know all these you know uh road and and park dedication and trail dedication fees all these dollars to these big cities, right? As they're developing. And then the cities go as far as when the builders pull the permits to have the water connection fees, the sewer. I mean, some of these cities, Chris, are $18,000 just to connect the water and the sewer. It's a fee. It has nothing to do with the cost of actually hooking it up. So it's like, then you have to hook it up. And it's like, 
you start looking at that kind of stuff and, I, and I'm, I'm, it's crazy to me. And, and it's like, so there's a lot of these local municipalities and counties and met councils and all these other things that are, that are adding to the cost of um, when they say we want things, it's usually they're the ones complaining that there's nothing that's affordable. They give you the illusion that it's the landowner, it's the builder that's being piggy. Hell, a lot of that is up front is, is the city fees, wax and sacks and counties. And if they backed out all their fatty garbage fees, you could probably build a house for 25000 less. Exactly, Andy. And it's like, oh, we'll give you this land, but we're going to charge you on the backside. It's just a way of moving the money around so you don't know who the heck is, you know, who's the bad boy here. Wrong. Well, and it's real simple. I mean, you do the math on it. You know, it's like you, you kind of have a situation where you, you take an acre of land, unless they can get two lots per acre because of roads and everything else, and they're, they'll be under half acre lot. You pay $50,000 for that piece of that one acre, and now you bought 100 acres, but in theory, right? And because there's going to be waste factors in there. So you have $25,000 raw cost for that dirt. And then you have about a forty-five to 50000 to seventy. When we did some stuff in Plymouth, it was almost eighty thousand dollars, guys, um, to improve those lots, cost of dirt and connection fees and whatever else. So now your 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 raw costs are anywhere from a hundred to one hundred and ten thousand. Plus, then you have to have you know your financing, unless you're paying cash. But then there's opportunity money there, and you have to have profit. So all of a sudden, you have lots that are one hundred and sixty, one hundred and seventy, two hundred thousand without even blinking an eye. And I tell you, they don't sell land in in, in uh, Plymouth for fifty thousand an acre. It's probably three hundred thousand an acre. So I mean, now you amplify that on top of it. That's why houses are a million dollars in Plymouth. Yeah. It's it's just real simple. So it's like, um, I don't know. I, I I don't want to sound like a complainer, but it's just there's a lot of people that could step out of the way and and make the costs become more affordable. And anyway. yeah, do you encourage paying your mortgage by month? It's great if you can. Uh, just make sure that the mortgage company is willing willing to take it and how they're willing to take it because you got to make sure you do that because sometimes when you're making um, these payments or extra payments, it's just going to go towards your escrow account. So make sure that uh, your mortgage company is uh, going to allow that. And it's good to be able to ask uh, the process before it even happens, not after the fact. I mean, obviously a lot of people are in it, but the whole the whole idea is is making that bi-weekly payment. You're making one extra payment a year. Could well, not. Well, think about this, Chris. A lot of these banks now, when you set that up, charge you so many fees. It's not even worth doing. So because they mm-hmm. they have an administrator, somebody administratively has to process that now twice. So your account costs them twice as much a month to have versus somebody pays once a month yeah. because they have to touch your stuff twice a month. And so they they will charge you more for it. So you just have to do the math and say, hey, is it worth doing? Or do I just, at the end of the month, when I pay the one payment, add an extra principal reduction uh, with that payment? And that's sometimes going to achieve the same thing and save you the fees. Yeah. Unreal. All this information, very valuable. Make sure to give us a, a like, uh, share with some friends, uh, subscribe to the YouTube, and buy, sell houses with us. Uh, we'll see you next week. Ciao, ciao. See ya. Where's this outro? Hold on. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on the Real Estate Radio Hour. Don't forget to visit our website, realestateradiohour.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or your preferred podcast listening app. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or sharing us with a friend. Until next time, stay awesome, Twin Cities.